Reggie Gibson is a literary performer who's lectured and performed in the U.S., Cuba, and Europe. He has received many awards of different types for his poetry, his performance. He is also a gifted musician, and he performs uh, with different groups of uh, musical theater as well as uh, different genres of music. He and his work appear in the movie Love Jones, a feature film <coughs> based on the events of his life, and he's been featured on HBO's Deaf Poetry Jam, and he's been a consultant for the National Endowment for the Arts, and he has performed with uh, groups like the Boston City Singers and the Mystic Chorale and Handel and Haydn Society and been published in many journals and magazines and the recipient of the Massachusetts Cultural Council Award and uh, many other distinguished awards as well. And uh, he comes uh, sharing his poetry and uh, his, how he gives it voice in his own special way. And I look forward to hearing him very much today. So delighted that he could join us as feature. So please give a warm welcome to Reggie Gibson. Counter. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, always like to say we're like a tribe of word nerds, right? Who else gets up at this time on a Saturday morning to go and hear somebody else put words and rhythm and rhyme and, and song and all that? And it's, it's, it's truly a blessing to have this. Um, anyone who writes, does anyone here write poetry? Let me see armpits, if you don't mind. Okay. I always ask for armpits. And we know how difficult this stuff is, right? And the only thing more difficult than writing it is actually getting people to sit still long enough to listen to it. <laughs> so whenever we have an audience, let's do our best not to abuse them and to respect, to respect what, that they've given us a little bit of their time. Um, a literary performer, people often ask me, what is that? And I guess it's, uh, it's something bringing together both the literary arts and the performative arts. Because I don't, uh, for myself, feel that just one of them actually uh, encompasses that. When I go back to the beginnings of our human history, that's pretty much what was going on. What we call orature is about how do we bring together the literature of the tribe, the oral literature of the tribe, and enact it in such a way that it has meaning, and we uh, so that so that it's understood that the body itself, the facial expression, the sound, all of that carries meaning beyond just the words themselves, beyond just the syntax, right? But it's it's about how we bring all of that together. And for the vast majority of our journey here on this blue-green stone careening through the heavy, mysterious black, we have been a species that was preliterate, right? And so much of our communication comes in a preliterate way. Um, I also call uh, much of what I do, I call it hip intellectualism, <laughs> right? And what does that mean? Well, I'm currently still working that out. I really don't quite know exactly what that means, but it was something that was impulsive. It came to me and it was like, yeah, um, it's a thing of, I think, of bringing together the things you've learned to see how they can enact themselves in life, how these things that we might be studying in some of our ivory or our ivy and ivory towers, these things that we might study, how do they really boogie on the ground, right? Other than that, they become intellectual exercises until they're actually enacted in the world in which we live. So how do we bring those two together? And for me, it's always meant bringing the language of where I've come to with the language of where I've come from, right? Which is a small picturesque of uh, French village in Chicago called Le Hood. <laughs> Some of you might know it as The Hood, but we call it Le Hood. It is very great. It's a really cool place. You should visit sometimes. Keep your windows rolled up. But it's, um, it's taught me a lot. And, and uh, one of those things is, is, is how to try to move through the world uh, and, and somehow better it, um, if one can. So I guess what I want to say is also in this place of Le Hood, we have many churches in other places, and what we say is when someone uh, can sing, we don't say they can sing. If they have something that gets inside of your DNA and somehow begins to separate the molecules, we say they can sing, okay? And therefore, there's this thing, too, that when someone who we meet, they have a thing about them that somehow gets inside of us and separates our molecules. I like to say it's, they got a thing about them. So what I would like you guys to do is to join with me in the mispronunciation of an English word. 
And so when I go, that thing, that thing, that thing, 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 be thankful, thankful for that thing. Can you try that? Yeah. All right, let's try it. That thing, that thing, that thing, 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 be thankful, thankful for that thing. I think you're the first audience that got it the first time. Must be a bunch of musicians. I saw guitars out in the audience. Okay, we're safe. For each one of us who's felt it, we know it's the sweetest feeling felt. That gentle touch of spirit that makes our defenses melt. It invades your attempt at language, yet it speaks through everyone. And at times when we are silent, we can hear it hum. It's the reason why we fall in love. It's why particles come in pairs. It's the yin and yang of molecules. It's why E equals MC squared. It's the reason we need poetry, because some phenomena can't be named. And I don't care what it is that began all this. Let's just be thankful for that thing. That thing, that thing, that thing, thing, thing. I'll be thankful, thankful for that thing. Now, I'm not here to tell anybody anything they don't already know. And that is everything is connected from the macro to the micro. Don't believe your deceiving eyes. Look deep inside, you'll see it's true that there's a universal union between the universe and you. Now, some find it in religion. Some through the sacred books of old. Some looking through the arts and the sciences or peering through a telescope. But it's the mother of all mysteries from DNA to the Big Bang. And I don't care what y'all call what began it all. Let's just be thankful for that thing. That thing, that thing, that thing, thing, thing. Be thankful, thankful for that thing. We're talking about prime causation, quantum fluctuation, cosmic inflation, particle creation, protons and neutrons colliding in deuterium, then into hydrogen, then into helium, then came the light out of a plasmic darkness, then came the time that the stars started sparking, in nucleosynthesis, first stars explode and then another generation of stars begin their genesis, dust balls forming, planets borning, earth is then birthed and then life begins dawning, prokaryote, cyanobacteria to eukaryote, then multicellular life becomes a settler, fish to amphibian, reptilian, mammalian, primate, great ape, then homo sapien, whatever it is that began those things I've named. Let's just be thankful for that thing, that thing, that thing, thing, thing. Be thankful, thankful for that thing. That thing, that thing, that thing, thing, thing. Be thankful, thankful for that thing. Thank you for playing. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think that that piece sprung out of an understanding that um, this human thing, right, whatever it is or whatever it's going to be, um, it's going to be partly a mixture and understanding of where we've come from, our potential for where we're going, but also the recognition that we are, are beings based in, in a world moving through it, but also we have an, instinctly, an instinctive understanding that there is something about us that makes us more than meat. And I think that's what art seeks to give us and language seeks to give us, is the understanding, a way to understand that we are more than just the summation of what we see in the mirror when we look back. And I think that's what poetry also gives us, that understanding, because if everything was as you see it, we wouldn't need to write about it. We wouldn't need to talk about it. We wouldn't need to illuminate the complexities and the nuance of it. So there's something that drives us to say, ah, there's a level, there's another level, there's a deeper level. And at that deeper level, maybe there's a connection. And I think it was Rukeyser, right, who said um, about um, islands, about swimming between them, that, um, that we, we have this basic perception that the islands are not connected, that they're separate entities off in this great sea. But if you go down deep, then there's the revelation. Ah, when you go deep, they're all connected, right? And I think that's what our art seeks to do, is to say, at what point are we all connected? And I guess that's a matter of how deep we are willing to go. So a piece I also like to bring us into is something I love doing because I believe in the community aspect that also helps to propel art and, and, and connection. So um, what I'd like to do is to give you a, a slight lecture in um, ethnomusicology and social linguistics but I will do that in 4-4 four, four time. 
and I will ask for your indulgence. So what I would ask is when I do this, um, uh, that you see me as an individual who was standing up on some great savanna somewhere trying to keep the tribe together, and that doing this is you talking back to me, giving me one word. And that word I always like to introduce is this Anglo-Saxon interrogative gruntable, which popped in your head, which is that impulse, like what? Right, like WTF without the TF. So what? That's a word that we give to an impulse, right, of surprise or seeking or, of t or an attempt to understand. It's a very important impulse that led to a very important word. So when I do like this, I would like you guys to give me like, what? Let's try it. One, two, three. What? All right, now that I like. <laughs> so let's take it back to the dawn of time. Before technology tamed our minds, when a man took his hands and began to clap. And that was the beginning of the boom, boom, bap. Let's take it back to the dawn of time. Before technology tamed our minds, when a woman started humming to an animal's call. And that was the beginning of the yes, yes, y'all. A yes, yes, y'all. Yes, yes, y'all. It's like that, it's like that, it's like that, y'all. Yes, yes, y'all. A yes, yes, y'all. Really? I think it's kind of like that. I have no proof, but that's what I think happened. So once again, here we are again, needing to feel what it means to be skin, to feel the systole and the diastole getting rolled into poetry and music and whatever comes from the soul. We know the body has intelligence of which the intellect cannot dismiss a consequence of biocultural experience. But let's take a quick trip and get a sense of what it means for you, 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 and me to have become human beings. Back in a time of which we cannot recall our ancestors drummed in the hum of night. Under these same stars, they believed were gods shining down as they danced by the firelight. Their bodies started moving, their voices started grunting, imitating animals. They knew they would be hunting on the next day to provide sustenance for their tribe. This was a ritual intended to recognize that life is born of death. Like sunrise and set cycling from east to west, the drums would beat and feet began to step. Moving from right to left, the men leapt as the chants began to rise from the women's breath. This is why music and poetry calls the blood. It's been this way since we crawled from the mud. An ancient thing banging in the body and the mind that we've been grooved into people since the dawn of time. So check it, let's take it back to the dawn of time Before technology tamed the mind A man took his hands and began to clap And that was the beginning of the boom, boom, bap Let's take it back to the dawn of time Before technology tamed the mind A woman started humming to an animal's call And that was the beginning of the yes, y'all A yes, yes, y'all Yes, yes, y'all It's like that, diggity, that, diggity, that, y'all It's like that, y'all It's like that, y'all It's like whether Irish or English or Spanish, Danish or Swedish or Polish, Russian or Turkish, Italian, German or Kurdish, Japanese or Assyrian, Javanese or Romanian, Portuguese or Hungarian, Hebrew, Zulu, Bavarian, no matter the tongue you speak, languages have a beat, the body instinctively translates into music. See what science has found, as we are all creatures of sound. And our ears need to seek rhythmic patterns in human speech, like the words I'm spitting, hear the rhythm that's in them, even before you get a hint of any content I'm kicking. You first think nothing of it but the verbal percussion begins to drum it inside of you and then your blood begins rushing your pulses get to throbbing your head might get to bobbing you feel in the effect of what the rhythm has been plotting it's gotten you to synchronize your alpha waves and realize that rhythm is more than musical but structurally underlies each and every atom to plasma scattered on saturn every stage of matter is organized in rhythmic patterns which are architectonic because everything has a tonic because everything has a cycle everything has a phonic life depends upon it we're engineered to want it. This thing that remains, refrains, comes back is chronic. This thing that haunts us all like a ghost in the mind. We've been dancing with y'all, dancing with y'all, dancing with y'all since the dawn of time. So check it. Let's take it back to the dawn of time. Before technology tamed the mind, a man took his hands and began to clap. And that was the beginning of the boom, boom. Bap. Let's take it back to the dawn of time Before technology tamed the mind A woman started humming to an animal's call And that was the beginning of the yes, y'all A yes, yes, y'all Yes, yes, y'all It's like that, the diggity that, the diggity that, y'all It's like that, y'all
that y'all. It's like meow, 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 that y'all. It's like 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 It's like that. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I noticed. How'd you guys know when it get quieter? Because I did. That's another reason why our species survived. Because we started to peep the game and say, OK, somebody's doing something. What do I do? Do I need to get myself in with what they're doing, simulate, emulate what it is they're doing? This is how we learn to become tribe. This is how we learn to become people. We begin to emulate each other. We develop a sense of morals out of that, a sense of how we're going to live with one another out of that. And so sometimes that leads us astray. Sometimes it brings us together. So the same impulse that brings us together can also separate us from other people. So it always needs to be questioned, right? And always needs to be, to be brought forward. Um, when I was um, in my 20s, and speaking about this, this impulse, when I was in my 20s, um, this guy uh, named Kent Foreman, I like to say I was suffering from the disease of my 20s. And Mr. Kent Foreman kind of found me. And um, he came to me and he said, you know, brother, if you don't drink yourself to death, you might make a halfway decent poet one day. Now, of course, me being all of 20 and filled with anger and, and malt liquor, right? I was like, man, get, get the hell away from me. You know, but he kept coming back. He kept coming back. And for whatever reason, he saw something that he wasn't going to let my prickliness scare him away from. Right. And I always have respect for people who do that, especially educators who see this thing in your students. Right. Trying to lead them somewhere. And, and it's like you have to there's a point when you have to say, I got to love you more than you loathe yourself right now. <laughs> you know, there's something in you that needs to be elevated. But you right now are too mired in, in, in the excesses of filth and thought and, and, and bad feelings about yourself that you don't you can't rise out of it. But you know what? I'm going to hold your hand as muddy as it is and lead you out of this. Right. Now, Kent, since we're in the throes of Valentine's Day and the aftermath of Valentine's Day, I was always a, a, a romantic type cat, right? Except when you're a romantic person in Le Hood, it can lead you to some bad decisions and people make fun of you and you get beat up. So uh, this was a guy who understood that. He, he would never write his work down, but I would come to him and I would talk to him when I was in the throes of heartbreak. And he said, listen to this piece. And I was in the throes of heartbreak so often, he had to always tell me, you need to hear this piece. So this is a piece from Kent Foreman. It's a gentleman who has passed on. Whatever is the glue that holds this universe together has told him his time was to go. And this is what he, he left uh, me with. And um, I give it to those of us who have survived love. Because if you have not had your heart broken, one of two things have happened. You have not loved enough, or you have not loved honestly enough. So this is from Mr. Kent Foreman. It is the law, that seasons, best-selling books, and empires come and go. Babies are born to die. Bridges are built to someday fall, and shoes wear out. Spring will return. It is the law. Fat, flat feet plod their beats. Time patrols this universe, enforcing the law. Love? Oh, well, that's a crime of passion. Innocent desperados, we wandered deep into the forest that we were, becoming awed by the miracles we became. Yes, we were beautiful, so young and beautiful, a little. And on nights amongst our pungent love, little muttered cries fluttered from your lips like startled doves, eclipsing when we would explode moaning godlike and spent in all of the furthest firmament I first led you down that road. Remember? Remember how once upon a love we laughed, how we were kind and cruel and a little bit daft, how we danced in the streets of Flatbush in Mardi Gras, too naive to count the cost of believing in fairy tales. But now we've lost, and this too is according to the law. And oh, I raged, raged like a teardrop angry with an ocean. Appeal denied. It was there and then that something deep inside of me died. But now, having wept my pain away, 
I close my eyes, lift my head, wish you luck and say, hey, I will not mourn the passing of a rose. For I am a law abiding citizen and everybody knows that spring will return. It is, it is the law. Thank you. And a um, bit of time, and I'll try to read through this one quickly before I do one more, if I can get out of here, uh, if I can get away from you guys, because I love you so much. Um, so I said I was a hopeless romantic, and of course, I found that out when I was around 13 years of age. I was a 13-year-old horny kid, and my mother had brought home a book, some books, and in that box of books was the complete works of William Shakespeare. Now, being a 13-year-old kid who had found himself being a flaming heterosexual in love with women who I could not convince to love me back, I had an immediate identification with Romeo because he's in the throes of heartbreak when you meet him, right? And so in seeing that and reading that book, uh, reading that play, it didn't really hit me until I saw the 1968 Franco Zeffirelli version starring Olivia Hussey and Leonard Whiting. If you out there in TV land have not seen that, you have no idea how impoverished your lives are. <laughs> you should go and check it out. So I discovered years later there was something called the Juliet Letters where you can actually write to Juliet of Capulate in Verona and someone on the staff will write you back. Some of them ask that you don't tell people what you've gotten back, but you can if you wish. But I'll share with you guys the first letter that I wrote to Juliet. Um, <clears throat> Dear Juliet, I have always wanted to write to you. I have started this letter several times, but always stopped. See, I was unsure as to what a 21st century African-American man would have in common with a 15th century Italian girl, especially given that at the time you were born, African-Americans hadn't yet been invented. I suppose it also would have been difficult to get a letter to you knowing how your kinsmen feel about conversations between you and men of which they do not approve. And I am sure by now your daddy has talked to your peeps in Venice about Brabantio and that whole Othello Desdemona thing. A tragic bit of business, that. I just want to ask you a question, though, Julie. What was Romeo really like? I mean, really. Yeah, I mean, the story is well known. He comes into a party at your crib, and all your cousins start putting the heavy hating on him. But he is cool as penguin poop. That is, until he sees you over there gyrating your hips on the dance floor to pan flute and fiddle. And then he steps to you like some medieval Mac Daddy, and next thing you know, you're leaving your family and a house full of bling to go and lick poison off his lips. Did you think to yourself, how doth one, how doth one wearing such tights and funny shoes have so much swagger? Have you seen any other films? Yeah, but well, don't go see that DiCaprio one. I mean, it's cool and all that, but it's a bit overwrought for my taste. But that Zeffirelli one? with Olivia Hussey playing you? Baby, that joint is epic. Were you that cute in real life? I mean, I know that during your time, you probably weren't that big on bathing or sewage or teeth, but I bet you had to have some pre-Renaissance hotness happening. But for real though, back to Romeo. Was there something in how he profaned the holy shrine of your hand? How he could not force his eyes to leave yours even when he gave you his lips sin then asked for it back again. Or how his kiss was authored by some ancient book that only opens inside of a young girl once. Sorry to talk so much about it, but ever since I was a boy, I have always wanted to be that kind of man. And now though I am married and things seem to be working out a little bit better for me and my wife than they did for you and Romeo, I would still like to know what made you love him that way? Well, enough for now, Jules. I'll write again when I can. I don't suppose you text or tweet, do you? Holler back at a brother when you get a minute, all right? Sincerely, someone who still finds a little bit of you in every woman. <laughs> Here we are in a 
seeing a star blend. Somewhere between Venus and Mars, short lived hominids hanging about, doing our best just to figure it out. Where do we come from? Where do we go? What does it mean to really question? What does it mean to really know? I mean, what is this thing that we've all deemed as reality? Is it real? Or is it just some imagined fallacy that we all have invented from our collective senses? Is this world merely a screen upon which shadows are beamed as they radiate emanating from a light screen from behind us? Why does space and time seem to confine us? Is there more to us? Or are we all just us floating here in this back of galactic blackness? Does anybody, any Anybody, anybody really, 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 really know what the fact is? I mean, like, is there a being listening to our prayers? Or are we all alone and there's just nothing there? I don't know the math, but I know somehow that one life plus two short equals live your life now. Because here we are in a sea of stars, somewhere between Venus and Mars. Short lived hominids hanging about, just doing our best, just figure it out. Aristotle, Plato, and Zeno, and Menides, Epicurus, Augustine, and Sartre, and Socrates, Bodhidharma, Gautama, Kant, and Protagoras, Kierkegaard, Hegel, Emerson, and Pythagoras, all of them relentlessly question dimensions that make up the makeup of this here human existence. The manic and the madness, the panic and the sadness, the inner and the outness, the how to be without this cause. Here we are in a sea of stars, somewhere between Venus and Mars. Short-lived hominids hanging about just doing our best to figure it out. I said, here we are in a sea of stars, somewhere between Venus and Mars. Short-lived hominids hanging about doing our best just to figure it out. That's what we use art for. That's what we use education for. To figure things out. Thank you guys for being here. And for helping me figure it out. <laughs> Thank you.